Good morning. Uh, this is the video lecture that goes with chapter 19. And this one is about the Atlantic slave trade. Um, I think it's really important to know that slavery has existed since antiquity. Uh, slavery has been present as far back as ancient Samaria. You find it in ancient Egypt, throughout the Christian Bible. Uh, you find it in Greek and Roman times. Uh, Spartacus may have been the most famous slave in history. Uh, he, of course, led a slave revolt against the Roman Republic in the year 73 BC. Uh, early slavery, it's rarely, if ever, based on race. In fact, race as we think of it is a fairly recent social construct, like I'm talking late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, the English Domesday Book was commissioned by William the Conqueror in the year 1085 and published in 1086. Uh, it's a population survey that William the Conqueror used, so he knew how to raise taxes to pay for his army. Uh, the Domesday Book, it surveyed the wealth and assets of all of his subjects, and what it revealed is that as early as 1086, 10% of the English population were slaves. Uh, we also like to think that slavery disappeared from Europe during medieval times, especially since we never really talk about it uh, but slavery, honestly, it stayed in Southern Europe. Uh, it stayed in Russia, and it stayed in other places as long, much longer than we want to admit. Uh, Sicily had slavery through the end of the 1500s. France had slavery through 1831. Uh, Russia, uh, officially slavery ends in 1720, but they have serfdom up until 1906. So forms of slavery existed and persisted in Europe a lot longer than we very commonly think of. Slavery in Africa looked very different from what we think of as slavery. Um, in Africa, slavery was made up of debt slavery. It was made up of military slavery, uh, prostitution slavery, criminal slavery, and slavery of war captives. Uh, there was some plantation style slavery, but that's very limited and very minor. Um, most African slavery revolved around the idea of domestic service. In this system, the slave would work around the house. The slave would work around the family of the master. Uh, but they would still have some freedom. These slaves could own profits. These slaves could marry. And these slaves could pass on property or wealth to their children. Their children were considered free. Their children were not slaves. And these slaves had some legal protections. They could sue or they could be sued. And when freed from bondage, these slaves were f allowed to integrate and join the society in which they had been working. Often, these slaves would be welcomed into the community. And in some cases, these slaves actually rose to the ranks to lead their communities following their, their um, <clears throat> imprisonment. Other slaves were treated as collateral to repay debts. Um, someone who owed a debt would perform work until that debt was paid off. Or they would give the person they owe the debt a child in exchange for releasing them from their own personal debt. <clears throat> you got slave soldiers who are forced to fight for their masters against their will. And there are even people taken as slaves for human sacrifice in Africa. When we often think of the European slave trade, there's an older slave trade that never really gets mentioned. As early as the first century AD, there's talk within Greek sources of Arab traders sending slaves from Africa to Muslim communities throughout Asia. These initial slaves were sent to go work on date plantations. Uh, eventually slavery spread to places like India and China, and all total, uh, more than 12 and a half million Africans were sent to slavery in Africa as part of this Islamic slave trade. Now, there is a preference for female slaves as well as young boys because they're the ones who are able to have children and work for longer periods of time. And these are some of the major uh, slave centers for the Islamic slave trade and the slave routes that were taken to get them to the coast. Now, the modern phenomenon of plantation slavery originated, believe it or not, with the Native Americans. Uh, Spanish and Portuguese planters would often exploit Indian labor against their will. Uh, think of the De La Casas reading that we had to do. Eventually, most of the Native 
populations. Uh, they're not used to the heavy work they're being required to do. Uh, they're going to die from either European diseases or they're going to literally be worked to death. Um, if you remember, 90% death rate. Uh, there's not enough people to continue the plantation system. And they're enslaved in their own homeland, so if they run away, they can hide. Sugar is a big reason that slaves are brought to the New World, probably the biggest one. You had to extract the sugar from the cane, and that made this an agricultural as well as an industrial process, and it required a lot of money, a lot of land, and a lot of labor. <clears throat> It's also really important to know that there was a period of white servitude that existed between Native American slavery and African slavery. Uh, you have indentured servants who are contracted for labor in return for free passage to the New World. You've got some convicts from places like England, Scotland, and Ireland who are seen as an undesirable population and they're gotten rid of. Uh, there's a group of people called Redemptioners. Uh, these are people who actually made arrangements to pay for their passage to the New World. But when they get to the New World, something has happened. And they don't have the money anymore when they arrive. And they have to work off their unplanned debts. White servitude, often voluntary, but it's very corrupt. Uh, the voluntary service could be the result of a forced contract. Or the voluntary service could be the result of kidnappings. <clears throat> In many ways, these white slaves were replaced by black slaves because once the white servitude contract was done, the labor was gone. And these servants who now were suddenly free become competition against those that were formerly forcing them into servitude. African slave labor, it's directly tied to the rise of sugar a need of control, the failure of indigenous slavery, and the inadequacy of this white servitude. Now the really big question people ask is why Africa? Why not Asia? Why not India? Um, quite honestly, it has to do with geography. It's a relatively short boat ride, a couple of days from the coast of Africa to the coast of South America across the Atlantic Ocean. It also has to do with the fact that there was an existing system of slavery in Africa that Europeans, especially the Portuguese, could just insert themselves into. Eventually, European powers are going to set up these, these uh, trading posts. They look like castles on the coast. And they're going to do business with African middlemen who will then bring slaves from the interior to the Europeans in exchange for guns and weapons and alcohol and other things that the African tribal leaders consider to be luxuries. All right, the Middle Passage, it's the name given to the process of taking slaves from Africa to the New World. Uh, there were 20 or so principal slave ports along the 3,000 mile coastline in West Africa, basically the Big Bend of Africa. Most of those sold into slavery were from somewhere else. So those who were sold into slavery, not necessarily from the Congo or Angola, they're not from Upper Guinea, they're from inland. They're from somewhere in the center or in the, the, the um, rainforest. The people that are gathered are gonna be prisoners of war, criminals, Sometimes a family is going to sell children in exchange for food. Uh, the reasons that they were put into slavery are the same as a couple slides ago. The difference is who they're going to be sold to and how they're going to be treated. This is a visual representation of where the slaves are going to go. Um, notice the Portuguese Empire gets the vast majority of the slaves, 32%. Uh, the Slave trade in Brazil is going to last all the way up until 1888. Brazil is actually going to be one of the last, if not the last, major country to give up the slave trade and it only does it because the English force them to.
Spanish colonies get 13%. The British islands get about 25%. And I want you to notice only 4% of the slave trade ends up in North America. Only 4%. And just think about how big of a role slavery and race relations and equality and the situation between you know, minorities plays into American history. It's only 4% of the slave population. Also, another thing about the Portuguese slaves. Average lifespan for a Portuguese slave, they were dead by the age of 24. Many Portuguese slave owners thought it was more economical to allow a slave to expire than it was to take care of them. In other words, for Brazil, it was less expensive to import a new slave than it was to keep the existing slave alive. And so they were treated as expendable. Now these slaves, they're sold and roped together. And they're roped together in what's known as a coffle. When they reach the coast, they're put into cages and then they're, they're inspected like cattle would be at an auction. Eventually, they're going to be taken to ships to be transported. And you have two different types of ships. You have ships that are considered loose packing ships. And there are ships that are considered tight packing ships. And the easiest way I can make this make sense to us today, loose packers were worried about quant quality. If they could get the majority of the slaves to the New World alive, they thought they could make more money. Tight packers were worried about quantity. They wanted to get as many people, period, to the New World as possible. Even if they lose some on the trip over, those who remain alive will make up for the cost of any who may have died. So loose packers are worried about quality. Tight packers are worried about quantity. It's a harsh way to think about it, but that is really the most understandable way to think of loose packing ships versus tight packing ships. <clears throat> this is what a coffle looked like, by the way. And you can see that slaves would be tied together with this wood, and then children would be roped together, and they would be forced to carry everything with them. And if you notice, the people who are driving the slaves, like this person right here, that is another African person with a gun. This is a visual representation of what a slave ship would look like. And these are cargo holds that would be completely full of people chained together, oftentimes to the point that they could not sit up or move. The air was stale. If somebody got sick, everybody got sick. And if somebody passed away, uh, you were going to be chained to them often until the end of the trip, unless whoever is running the, the crew is willing to unshackle the dead person and throw them overboard into the sea. What happens at auction? Sometimes all the cargo is sold to one planter. Uh, the deal is made before the ship even leaves Africa. Typically the dealer is going to charge about a 15% sales commission right off the top. And <clears throat> if the whole cargo is not for one planter, those people will be sold individually at auction. From time to time, the captains themselves will sell slaves, but usually there's a broker or a dealer involved. When the survivors get to the New World, they're going to be put on an auction block. They're going to be examined. The dead are going to be separated. The diseased are going to be separated. And those who are healthy enough to stand for auction are going to be taken to a literal auction block, put up on display just like you would any other auction item, and they're going to be examined by potential buyers. They're going to look for teeth. They're going to look for movement and flexibility. They're going to look for demeanor and disposition. And really, these soon-to-be slaves are treated no different than like cattle would be in an auction. This all comes down to something known as the triangular trade. Um, Africa, the Americas, and Europe, they're going to be linked together in this commercial system. 
Slaves who are purchased in Africa will be sent to the New World. Sugar taken from the Caribbean will either be sent to North America for processing or to Europe. American and European merchants are going to buy all the sugar with rum. And then the rum is taken back to Africa. And that's used along with um, weapons to purchase more slaves. Eventually, this system will be replicated with tobacco plantations, cotton plantations, rice plantations, you name it. And this is just a visual representation of the triangular trade here. Now, the big question is how many? There's been a lot of research done on this. A lot of records have been kept. And our numbers vary widely. Paul Lovejoy, one of the most well-known researchers of the African slave trade, estimates 12 million. Joseph Inakori, who is another very well-known researcher of the African slave trade, puts it almost as high as 14 million. Uh, the thing is, though, we will never know the truth. We will never know exactly how many people. In addition to this 12 million who went to the European slave trade, that's not including the 12 million who went to that Muslim Asian slave trade. Either way, it's millions and millions of people. All right. Well, I appreciate you watching. If you have any questions, send me an email. And I'll be happy to answer. We'll see you soon.